Well, we haven't done this in a while, so I actually found a pretty reasonably priced CJ2A for sale. And uh, you know me, I had to go scoop it up. So the story goes, the guy I bought it from uh, purchased it to restore it with his son. They did this about 15 years ago. Um, him and his brother, the guy I bought it from, both bought one. They're both families going to restore one. The brother did, but this guy did not. And, you know, it's the age-old problem where the kids grew up, went to college, moved away from home. So the last thing I want to do when they come visit the family is to come work on some old rusty Jeep. So it's just sat in this barn. Now he claims that it did run and drive and they drove it into the barn. And I really have no reason to not believe him. He's a super nice guy. Uh, great to work with. Just a quick glance here. So he said that when he bought it, the fuel pump wasn't working. So he put a tank up here and just gravity fed in the carburetor. He put new spark plugs in it, plug wires. Now you can see, I drove this thing home and it's pouring down rain. So what happens is the rain comes down in through here right into the spark plug hole. So if a Jeep sits outside for many years, that's what rusts into uh, the plugs and then the insides get rusty. So I did go ahead and pull up this coil because I want to know, A, even though it has alternator, is it a 6 or 12 volt coil? Because you can never trust anything on an old vehicle. And I saw they had this external resistor really kind of hacked onto here. I mean, then kind of out there. So I pulled this out, and it is a 12 volt coil with external resistor required. So we're just going to leave that for now. So the purpose of getting it running now is to make sure, does the engine run? Is the clutch free? That dictates a lot what we're going to do with it. So what I'm going to do, because I hate old wiring, it's dangerous. It can burn down your whole shop, many bad things. So what we're going to do is go ahead and we're just, I mean, look at that mess. They're so stiff. I mean, you can't, you shouldn't be able to crunch a wire. So we're going to go ahead and clear that off. We're going to make a nice little ignition setup to figure that out. The oil, he said he did change the oil when uh, he brought it home. That oil is actually very clean, it's not black, so that's great. So this was in this guy's barn, I guess he called it a barn fine. It was in, I mean, just plain Tetris to get things through there. You could hardly walk around the Jeep and his other toys. So you can see at a first glance that the body has been reskinned and not a very good job at that, which unfortunately is pretty common on these old Jeeps, so it goes all the way around. And then you can see where they kinda they beat it around the corner here, the old body's underneath. Some sort of half cap, probably something we could order Sears back in the day. It's missing the doors and the back piece, but the nice thing is, people that have these cabs, there's some people that uh, will just part them out or give them away, so if you want to keep the half cab, you can acquire these parts for free, essentially. And it's one of those things where if you do want to take this cab off, you're in for a world of just pain because it's screwed to here, and you know those are gonna strip out. It looks like they reskinned it up to here, and they got screws going in. So it's just a, gonna be a mess. We do have some rusty floors in here. Definitely not the greatest body, but so the reason why this thing is worth saving is because a, the engine might run. Number two, the tranny seems to shift from two to three, pretty good. The reverse to first does not work transfer case works good so got the good engine possibly good training transfer case the drivetrain as a whole is pretty complete I mean it's even got the uh, air cleaner right there and then the most important thing is this thing has a clear title that is huge on old Jeeps so those things alone are making it worth fixing up now we could also see at a first glance here this was a plow Jeep at one point how do you know it's a plow Jeep? Because it's got all this boogering on the front frame. And then if you go further, you can see these old plow brackets are still kind of welded over here, uh, right behind the shackle. And that was to reinforce the frame so that way they didn't buckle. So we do have one seat in here. An ORV sticker on it from 1989. So 89 from there, 79 on here. So it's realistic to say this thing probably hasn't been on the trail for you know, 25, 30 years. I'm assuming they ran it for a few years after that. So we're gonna go ahead and see if we can't get her going. 
So at a first glance, after blowing the water out of the spark plug holes, I want to look inside the carburetor. It looks like it'd be pieces of corn down inside the carburetor, so we're going to take that off, which sucks. Alrighty, moment of truth. That only took about 30 seconds because the fuel line wasn't on, but... And I stand correct. There's a better view of said corn inside the intake. So we're going to get that out. Now what we're going to do, because I found so much nastiness down in the intake, we're going to go ahead and pull these plugs. And, uh, actually not terrible. So, we're going to clean off the plugs. That way we make sure it runs really nice. And, wow, that one's pretty good too. And, uh, let's see. That one is excellent. That one is excellent. So typically what can happen is when the piston's sitting there, it can get a ring of rust around the top. And if you try to crank the engine and move the piston up and down, it scorches the side of the cylinders, destroys the rings. So we're gonna let this stuff soak while we're doing other things on the engine. That way if there is any, it will break it up. The problem with the fly is if you have a boroscope, you can't really get to the cylinder because straight down in the plug are the valves and the pistons are actually, you know, back here relative to the spark plug. So it's hard to get one down and then to look inside there. So this is just precautionary. It does turn over, but we just want to be safe. Now, because we poured ATF down the cylinders, when this thing fires up, it is going to smoke like a banshee because ATF is flammable. You need a contraption like this to go in there and to aim down into the cylinders. So that's why that's like that. So we got rid of our corn on the carb here. Got her decently cleaned up so that way we can at least see if the thing will run before we get crazy. Now one thing you always want to do with a Willys carburetor is come over to the front of it on the float bowl. You want to count how many patent numbers there are. Because the World War II carburetors, there are less patent numbers than the CJ2A ones. And if you have a World War II carburetor, you can sell it to someone who needs it and be able to purchase a rebuilt correct carburetor for your Jeep because those it's the same carburetor, just different patent numbers on the side and that's a good cheap way to get your Jeep going. Here's our carburetor ready to rock-ish. So we'll go ahead and slap her on and see what happens. Now one interesting thing about a Willys carburetor is uh, see these two nuts that go on the bottom? You actually can't even get this first nut on unless the carburetor is actually raised up. So you can't get the nut completely off unless you're holding the carburetor up as well. And for some reason, someone had two gaskets on the bottom of this, so I took one off. And uh, we'll see if we don't get a vacuum leak. So they didn't have any thick wire for the starter, so they just used two skinny wires and put that to the starter terminal. This thing was a fire waiting to happen. Then they twisted that wire around. Oh my god. I mean, this is probably the most dangerous thing I have ever seen in a Willys Jeep. No! It's one wire that they stripped around and then they wrapped it in a U shape. Oh my gosh. Now, here is the most alarming part of this wiring. So, I went ahead and I disconnected the alternator because uh, you never know what the condition of that is. So they got this messy harness that went from the alternator to the solenoid where it obviously would charge and then into the dash. Now get this. All that wiring goes to the amp meter. Now in old school vehicles, the amp meters read where all the battery power in the vehicle goes through this gauge, which is a horrible, horrible fire hazard. It's not like a voltmeter where you hook up your positive and negative and reads the volts. This measures the amps that goes through the Jeep's whole system, so all that wiring is going to a gauge, and I have had a Jeep before where the gauge has went up in smoke, so we're cutting that out. It's, that's sketch. That is not FAA approved. Hard mounting the coil resistor. What a thought. Now something to keep in mind here when you're doing something like this, do not use a self-tapping screw such as this. 
because when you push it through the firewall, you know what's over here is your passenger's feet. And if they go put their feet up there and puncture them, that wouldn't be a good situation. So I got a nice uh, quarter inch bolt. Now you see we got the original air cleaner here and I made sure that, that would clear all this stuff and it's gonna keep it pretty hidden so that's gonna be sweet. And there is enough room between those. So personally I like these key switches that only have three terminals on them. You got battery, ignition, and the starter terminal. Super easy. So what I always do is find three spools of wire. Now I always run the thicker wire for the positive off the battery. That way in case someone in the future is running a fuse block off the uh, key switch system, they have plenty of voltage for that. They got one wire for the starter and then one for the ignition. So what I do is I get all my wires taped together in three. Now we're just trying to see if this thing will even run. And uh, the uh, smart thing to do would be put some loom over this wire. But for now, we're going to thread that through. This is my favorite spot to put the key switch because that's a nice area to do so. So you just feed it through. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to test fire. And by test fire, I mean see if the starter will actually crank over first. So right now I've got the wiring all finished down here. Super clean where all this kind of goes into one nice loop. This external ballast resistor is kind of neat. So you hook it up two different ways. The one way you go from the coil to here to the starter solenoid, then the other one to the key switch. Now a normal coil with internal resistor, you just hook that straight to the key switch. But by having this double system, when you're cranking the battery, it sort of bypasses this in a way and gives us more voltage and that helps it fire up. So we're just gonna hit the key switch and see if the starter A, does it work? And B, does the engine turn over? Normally this is about the first thing I would do when I buy a Jeep like this, but since the engine spun over pretty good by hand, and I really trusted the uh, guy I bought it from. I just went through and did the key switch and rather than hot wiring the whole thing. Now remember that we poured ATF down these cylinders. So if you stick in the spark plugs and you try to run it, they're just going to foul out the plugs. So what I've got is a piece of cardboard weighed down by the hammer over here. We're going to let it turn over and shoot the ATF up out of the pistons. And then that'll get us ready to go. Well, I'm dumb, so you're going to see me jump start in this Jeep because the key switch doesn't work. But really, a week later, I figured out that I had the key switch wire hooked up to the starter side and not to the battery side, so it was not even turned on the solenoid. A dumb mistake I made late at night, but oh well, figured it out eventually. So I'm going to jump straight to the starter. Hey, there we go. We'll see if she'll turn over some more. Ah, not bad, not bad at all. Since it's getting late and the battery on the camera's dying, we're gonna go ahead and we're just gonna jump start it and see will it run on starting fluid. That way I know tonight if I gotta wear anything off Amazon, like a coil or points or whatever, I'll be able to do it. So we're gonna go ahead, give her some love juice. Well, I'm having trouble with getting it running, so I did a compression test. No bueno. That's what all the pistons look like. We might be screwed. We got some great news. So the other night, uh, you know, we tried to get this thing running, wouldn't fire up, wouldn't fire. And I was like, man, I should probably do a compression test. And it was 50, 50, 50, 50. And I immediately thought, man, this thing's dead. We're pretty much screwed in the water. And uh, talking to Ed, and he's like, well, maybe the piston rings are, you know, just kind of stuck down there and throw some ATF down and let it stick for a couple days. And that's what we did. And this piston's at 125, which is basically perfect. So we're going to go ahead and test the other one. You see where all the ATF blew out of the holes on the other one. So I'm excited. Come on, baby, don't let me down. That is what we're talking about, yeah! It's about time I get a win around here. So that's two 
with good compression. That's a winner. Well folks, we have tried everything. We just can't get her to go. So last night you saw that we got compression on these front two and then these were a little low. Well today I thought, all right, well, I checked compression back there, they're still low, so we tried pushing it with the forklift to see if we can get the engine to pop over and then free up the rings as it ran. Well, wouldn't work, wouldn't work, brought it back inside, then I found out that these two have lost compression again. So, we're gonna have to yank the head off and uh, look down in the cylinders and see what size rings they are, that way we can get those coming. With the pistons out and some deeper inspection done, I actually found some pretty bad news, but good news because we know we can fix it. So the first piston, there's a, I mean all of them, they have a lot of crud. What I'm finding is that the rings are getting caught inside the crud and they're not freely moving in and out, which would not create a seal inside the cylinder wall. Now this one, you can see there's parts of broken ring right here and a huge gap. There's actually another broken piece right there. So this one's got a broken ring. There's this much gap that's not sealing. I also found a metal strand hanging out of uh, both of these actually. So this one does not have broken rings. However, once again, rings can't freely move in here because of the rust. And there's some strands of metal hanging off of it. And then this one is also broken. There's a big gap right inside of here where the ring is not sealing. So this was the one that was pretty good. You know, for a short time that lost compression, well that's because the rings probably got stuck in there. This one did have compression for a bit, but it lost compression. I'm assuming that's when the ring broke. This one was at a 90, so it was sealing okay. And then this one was no compression and that was like 50 pounds and that's why. So. Probably what happened is when these two had compression, the more the thing moved up and down, there's probably some rust in the cylinder walls and it just ate apart everything. So that's just what happened. So we're these are actually standard bore pistons. So we're gonna go ahead, order some piston rings, oil pan gasket. We need a head gasket, a fuel pump. Some of the parts came in for the old yellow Jeep today. So because it's missing headlights, I took this opportunity to uh, get some halogen headlights. I just noticed this thing on the windshield. It kind of looks like coloring book page, but it might also be like a 4x4 club decal, which That'd be pretty cool. So we do have a problem where the shifter will shift from uh, two to three this way, but if you go over to this side, it doesn't want to go anywhere. Two to three is fine. Here we go. Uh, what are we gonna find? What are we gonna find? Oh, that's not bad. It's not bad. Well, it leaves some to be desired, but not terrible. What to expect it after sitting for 15 years? Well, I can already tell you that the shifter tower is going to be the problem. So this gear slides back and forth as it should. Now this gear also slides back and forth as it should. So that means our shifter tower is stuck. Here are two shift forks, so this one seems to rotate nice. That one's a little cruddy. So, two to three works, obviously. One to two, nada. So, the problem lies in the shifter tower. Nothing a little bit of beating back and forth will fix. Well, two hits with the rubber mount later. Check it out. Slides back and forth just like this one. So if you got your shifter sitting in there, check it out. Moves like a dream. I like it. The previous one removed the rear drive shaft off the axle itself but not the transmission. That way he could flat tow at home. The problem is, is he lost the end caps. 
they go on this thing for the U joints. I thought, well, okay, I got other end caps sitting around, just swap them to this. Well, it's a weird size and nothing fits and nothing fits under the yoke on the axle. So I was like, all right, well, I'll just unbolt it and I'll put the other dry shaft I have on there. Well, the problem is on the rear of the transfer case, on the rear of the transfer case where the dry shaft bolts onto, there's a e-brake drum. All right, so the bolts to hold on the drive shaft go through the e-brake drum like this, through the yoke, and then that yoke bolts to the drive shaft. So as you tighten or loosen the bolt, it's supposed to get caught, and that way it doesn't spin. Well, the problem is this one was spinning because it is wallered out the slot right there. We cut the bolt in half that was in here wallering and around, so to replace the bolt, I removed the yoke, the drum, because I got the yoke out, it's just dumping oil everywhere. I mean, it's turned into a mess all because of some end caps over here. All of our new piston rings are on. Spent hours cleaning out those pistons because they had so much carbon deposit in them. There are the old rings that we knocked out. It's currently 10 p.m. Now Thursday nights, the next day. Last night, it just it wasn't happening. This is what they call a ridge reamer, and I'll show you what this thing is for. As the piston goes up and down inside the cylinder wall, it comes up pretty close to the top, but not quite, especially the rings since they sit a little bit lower. What happens is it wears out the cylinder here, but not up here. So what happens the middle section is worn to a certain point, the top section is worn to a certain point. So if you run your nail through here, you actually get caught towards the top of the cylinder wall. So the pistons are still in the block and you've got a pretty bad ridge right here. When you go to pop them out, you can break piston rings, scar the piston, etc which my piston rings were broke when I took them out. However, there were pieces of rings sitting inside the oil pan when I had the oil pan off before I even screwed with this, so my rings were broken beforehand. These rings, when they hit the top of that ridge, they start chattering a little bit up against the top, and you can mess up your rings a little bit, make some really bad wears. So that's why we have the almighty ridge reamer. So this thing's pretty neat. It's got two ends on it right here, and then the third end is a knife. I got this on Amazon for like 50 bucks. So it does have an o-ring that goes all the way around it, which I did put some oil on. And then I got lots of oil inside the cylinder right here to keep her good and lubed up. So what you do is you take your little ridge reamer, you drop it in there like so. Now it's gonna be kind of sloppy in there. So there's a top bolt right here. So you wanna just kinda take a wrench, in this case it's a 9 16 Go ahead and just tighten her a little bit and see if it kind of spins around pretty good. Also note, I did oil the top of the surface, that way this thing can spin pretty good. And it keeps it from rusting while you're working on it. So that seems to be pretty good there. So we'll go ahead and tighten her a little bit more. All right, and she is good and centered. You wanna make sure it is centered. So now that we got it good and centered, tighten it to there. Now I cannot turn it by hand, so that's where you take a larger ratchet, turn it around. You can hear it cutting. Rinse and repeat that until you can no longer feel that hard edge inside the cylinder wall. So this one, I've already done it and it feels really good. Now you don't wanna to go too far because this thing tapers the top of the wall, so if you go super far, it's not good. So just do it until you can't quite feel that ring anymore. And we're going to do that to all of them. All four cylinders have been reamed. So now what we got to do, since we just ran basically a knife edge around this, there's a, just a little bit of, you can feel kind of some roughness. So we're going to take ye old faithful dingle hone here. Just go up and down this a little bit, a few times, and get that roughness out. And we'll feel it. I like it. We got piston number one and four in. Then I want to do two and three. And one's missing. So what happened? Well, this thing has been fighting me every step of the way. Doesn't matter if it's pistons or gaskets or carburetor. Everything is fighting me. So here's the last piston. You can actually see it is broken on the top. See where it's bent up right there? This ring compressor I have just absolutely sucks and the one band broke off of it. So if you don't know what a ring compressor is, you basically put this around the piston and you tighten it 
and uh, it basically clamps the rings close to the piston that way you can get it to slide into the cylinder bore because these moving it out like that you never get the piston in the bore like that the ring compressor sucks the piston you know I, it's not like you even hit it that hard it just crunched on me so I don't know if just the carbon buildup that I cleaned out of there just made it really weak or what the story is but so that sucks so I had to buy a new piston and a new set of rings for one piston I didn't want to buy a set for all four so that was a $65 setback and we gotta wait a few days check this out I was messing with the radiator hose and noticed it was a little dry rotted and cracked I was like well we're going to fix that. It's actually a piece of metal exhaust pipe from AutoZone that's rotted and uh, that's not good so we're going to go ahead and replace that thing. Alrighty everyone, she's all assembled. We, we skipped pretty far ahead but it's getting late about 11 o'clock at night and I'm just ready to get this thing together and rolling. So we got the head on, the spark plugs, oil, antifreeze, spark plug wires, battery, etc. All that's in. Went to put some gas in it. We do have a slow dribble back there, which kind of sucks. I am hopeful. Air cleaner's all on. I mean, this thing is PRO professional. Now, if I had to make any bets before this thing starts, it's going to just billow smoke out of here. If you go back early in the video where I was dumping ATF down the spark plug holes, a lot of that goes straight into the exhaust manifold down there. I'm going to bet she's going to smoke like a banshee, but she's going to clear out. Unfortunately, ye old willies still has low compression. We got 55, 60, 75, 55. I know the rings aren't seated yet. However, uh, this thing is extremely hard to start. You can see in, early in the video, I couldn't get it started. We ended up push starting it with the forklift uh, today. And it did start a couple times on its own. So, matter of getting the rings reseated, and it truly does need a valve job. Something I didn't do, but it probably needs that because I'm sure it's just leaking right through the valves. 